One day, Marina Musasanyana from Zimbabwe left her two kids under an umbrella on the bank of a river while she went fishing. Suddenly, the woman heard a scream and saw a huge crocodile dragging her son into the water. Maybe if the mother had been a little slower, the reptile would have escaped with the prey, but Marina rushed to the crocodile and pressed its nose very tightly with her fingers. With her other hand, she freed her kid's head from the jaws, and the crocodile couldn't fight back. It just bit the woman, but eventually retreated. The child was taken to the hospital, and soon he fully recovered, as did Marina. This story would look like some kind of village legend if it didn't actually happen in 2020. And the technique the woman used actually works, although it does sound like a silly myth. Crocodiles and alligators are natural killing machines. They had millions of years to hone their hunting skills, but even if you get into the mouth of a predator, you still have a chance to survive. The important thing is to keep fighting and to know where to strike. Marina from Zimbabwe did the right thing. There are only a few weak points on the face of reptiles you can hit. Nostrils are one of them. If you hit the crocodile there or at least pinch the nostrils, the predator has to open its jaws. Another option is to go for the eyes. Many experts agree that when attacking a bloodthirsty monster, poking it in the eye might work. This is where the memory accumulated over the years of evolution comes into play. Crocodiles know the eyes are their most vulnerable spot, which means that if something threatens their eyes, they need to let go of this something as soon as possible and swim somewhere far away. But what surprised me the most was fighting the crocodile from the inside. So let's say your hand is in the crocodile's mouth, its jaws are clenched. Turns out it's not a hopeless situation. At the back of the animal's mouth, there's something like a valve that closes the throat so that the croc doesn't drown even if it dives with its mouth open. First, this valve seems to be quite sensitive. And second, if you damage it, the water will flow not where the crocodile would like it to. In short, you can literally try to drown the crocodile. Most likely, the predator will be so surprised and scared it'll let you go. Well, of course, you can only drown a crocodile if you have to fight it in the water. How about fending off a bigger animal? A polar bear's not an option. Oh, what about an elephant? Elephants are actually quite dangerous and sometimes ready to attack a person. I even came across a statistic that says elephants kill more people than any other large land mammal. Aside from hippos and buffaloes, of course. But an aggressive-looking elephant won't always attack you. This usually happens during the breeding season, when males basically attack everything that moves. At any other time, the elephant can bluff. Put your strength to the test, and this behavior has its signs. Are the elephant's ears fanned out wide to make it look bigger? Is it swaying from side to side? Is its trunk swaying back and forth or hanging down low? This is a bluff. The elephant's trying to intimidate you. But if an animal pins its ears to its head and its trunk is curled up, then it can hardly be stopped. It's time to run for your life ASAP. But how do you do that? I mean, elephants are huge. How can you scare away an animal this big? Oddly enough, you just need the right sounds. Elephants are not afraid of mice. This is a made-up story. But they simply can't stand bees. The sound of buzzing alone is enough for a herd of elephants to scatter in different directions. Scientists even did studies on this topic. Ten seconds after they turned on the pre-recorded buzzing, half of the elephant family ran away, occasionally glancing at the speakers. By the 80-second mark, all elephants but one were gone. Maybe that elephant was a little hard of hearing. So if you have powerful speakers and a recording of the sounds of African bees, this can actually work. Though it all seems a little weird. How can animals with such thick skin be so afraid of some tiny bees? The bees won't even penetrate it. No, they won't. But when the bees swarm, that is, when the colony splits up and part of it looks for a new place to live, they can become very angry. Well, you can understand them. You already feel quite nervous moving to a different place, and then there's some elephants in your way? In general, at the time of swarming, hundreds of bees can sting elephants in their most sensitive places, the trunk, mouth, and eyes. It hurts. Elephants don't like when it hurts. So much so that farmers even deliberately set up real and fake hives on the borders of their lands. Up to 80% of elephants try to stay away from bee territory. Well, in order to convince farmers this would work, scientists had to put in a lot of effort. Animals don't easily give out their secrets and weaknesses. Sometimes researchers have to go to extreme lengths. A Canadian man, Troy Hurtabies, once stumbled upon a grizzly in the forest. 
The bear attacked him, but the man survived. Survived and decided to make a grizzly-proof suit to learn more about the animals. <laughs> and he did. The suit was made up of metal, airbags, the material of Troy's own creation, and plenty of duct tape. It turned out to be something like a low-budget RoboCop cosplay, but the suit had to be tested. Since it was dangerous to go looking for grizzlies right away, Troy designed his own tests. Trucks driving into him, being beaten with baseball bats and some kind of boards, walking through a giant fire, the suit endured it all. And who knows, maybe it would really help study the grizzlies. Except Troy never had an encounter with the bear again. Even when he was taken to the Rocky Mountains of Alberta, the Grizzlies refused to make any contact. Jason Bedridzi has quite a different story. Since childhood, the Georgian zoologist has been fascinated by wolves. When he turned 30, Bedridzi went to the Borjomi Nature Reserve in Georgia to study wild wolves. But not just look at the predators from the distance. He became part of the pack. He slept with the wolves wrapped in a thick fur coat, helped them hunt and studied their habits. In turn, the wolves shared their prey, fed the scientists when he was sick or injured, and even protected him from bears. Once every few months, Bedridzi saw his family and then returned to live with the wolves again. After two years in a wolf pack, the scientists decided to help the wolf cubs raised in captivity. They needed to learn a lot in order to return to the wild. Over several decades, Bedridzi raised about a hundred wolves, taught them to stay away from people, and actually taught them how to be wolves. What an amazing person. Thanks to such scientists, we now know so much about animals. However, sometimes knowledge comes to people through the experience, and they use them in their own way. Here's a simple example. In India, farmers suffered so much from monkey invasions, they began to paint their dogs to look like tigers. Anyway, Steve and I found a few similar stories. People painted stripes on dogs with ordinary hair dye. And this was enough to scare away monkeys. <laughs> they stay away. Better safe than sorry. But what the farmers from the Indian state of Telangana came up with made me laugh for several minutes in a row because <laughs> they hired a dude who for $6 a day puts on a bear costume and runs around the fields to scare away other animals. Of course, when you see this, you want to stay away from the crops as far as possible. Ingenuity on the level of Nicolas Cage and the Wicker Man, or perhaps even better. And how do you like this idea? To turn cows into zebras? Well, not to drive away monkeys or any predators, this camouflage reduces fly bites by about 50%. Scientists believe the stripes simply confuse the insects they don't understand if the cow is moving, where it's going, where they should land, and where to bite. This technology could become an environmentally friendly alternative to pesticides. In short, it's a win-win. But to figure out why zebras have stripes in the first place and how they work, scientists had to work hard. Especially Tim Cairo, a British evolutionary ecologist who spent 10 years under the scorching sun of Tanzania to study zebras. And he acted, let's say, by trial and error. For example, he made several striped pajama-like suits and wore them while slowly walking through the territory of the zebras. He counted how many flies landed on him. Then he did the same dressed in a zebra pelt. Now, imagine you're walking through a national park in a zebra suit. Keep in mind there are lions there, hungry lions. But in the end, Caro's suffering paid off. He compared all the data he received and found out that zebras indeed got stripes to fend off flies. Don't ask this guy why pandas are black and white. He seems to get too carried away by his research. What is it? Really? Hmm. Steve says people painted stripes on cows back in World War II, but not because of flies. When the electricity was shut down, the cows became a real traffic hazard. It was almost impossible to spot them in the dark. So, people of Great Britain came up with the idea of drawing white stripes on animals. You know, kind of like warning signs. Imagine if they were also reflective. That's not something I came up with. In 2015, farmers in the British city of Hungerford were asked to put fluorescent jackets with luminous strings on their cows. Or flashing collars. In general, do something to make it easier for drivers to spot animals in the dark 
because several times collisions ended in serious injuries. For some reason, the locals didn't really appreciate the idea. They say this is expensive and not very effective. Unlike robotic deer designed to fight poachers. What? Yes, these do exist, and they're used in the USA. The way it works is simple. First, they get reports of illegal hunting in some area. For example, for deer. American law enforcement officers arrive at the place and install a decoy robot then hide nearby and use the remote control to make the robot move. When the poachers shoot, they get caught red-handed. Yes, we have to admit that these super-realistic robots are also damn expensive. A deer costs about $2,000, and an American black bear, $5,000. And just when I thought a stuffed robotic deer was the weirdest thing of the day, it turned out that conservationists are putting cameras in the horns of rhinos straight inside them. Seriously. It's a rather clever buildup. Sensors analyze the rhino's heart rate, and if it suddenly increases or drops sharply, the operators can remotely activate the tiny camera in the rhino horn. A leather collar around the animal's neck also tracks its GPS coordinates, and authorities can quickly come to the rescue. Scientists hope that when this program is broadly deployed, poachers will begin to steer clear of the rhinos that participate in it. Well, yeah. Who would dare commit a crime when a horn is watching you? See you later.